After the EU referendum, what are we to make of democracy in the UK and of democracy as an idea and an ideal? I'm at the beautiful Clare College in Cambridge to speak with Professor Paul Cartledge, author of Democracy, A Life. We distinguish between local government and Westminster or Holyrood, whatever it is, and quite rightly, I mean, this is a step change. It's a completely different sort of thing. Well, the Athenians recognised that, and they had local government, local politics. And so actually quite a number of Athenians probably were familiar mainly or only with what went on locally. But what that meant was their dad, their cousin, their uncles, and they'd go to the local meeting, like a town meeting in the eastern states of America, and then come home and chat about it. And that's sort of normal. What for us, politics is a very abnormal thing. A plebiscite is very abnormal politics. And you say that if an ancient Athenian would come to America or Britain now, they would look at our democracy, you say, as a disguised oligarchy. Well, this is more subtle point, because in a way, we have a, a mass democracy at certain times. In other words, general election. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the distinction that I'm drawing there is we choose when we elect others to rule in for us, we hope, you know, on our behalf, not just instead of us. But the ancients believed that if you rule, if you have the power, then you rule. You don't delegate. They, don't, they didn't have the notion of representative democracy. And that's what I mean by uh, the institutional distinction. There is actually, though, a, a separate point, which is, of course, it's very much more blatant in the States than it is over here, though it does exist here. The more money you spend, on a candidate or a campaign, the more likely, this is simply fact, to get your point of view or your vote or your candidate uh, into um, the majority view. So, so, I mean, let's be honest here. It, is it possible to have an authentic, successfully functioning democratic society with the acute inequality that we see in the United States and increasingly in the UK? In practice, no. The estates put up extra barriers, which we don't. Let's say you have to register for a party or register not for a party, but you have to make a big point of um, registering. And the percentage of the potential electorate that are registered is actually very small. I wouldn't want to say that parliamentary democracy in and of itself is necessarily a bad thing. What I think it should be allied with is more consultation. And after all, online, websites, you YouGov, constant polls which are not at all uh, probative, in other words, nothing hangs on them, they're, they're just informational. Well, that could be beefed up. Something like, I think I may advocate this actually in the book, um, nearer to a Swiss referendum style, that's national, but the Swiss also have local parliaments uh, in the cantons, especially the German speaking ones, where, as you were saying, anybody can speak, butcher, baker, roll up, they know the score and people know, ah, you're speaking, I yes, I know you. Well, one of the issues is not just size, it's not just um, the nature of the population, but it's face-to-face -face intervisibility that makes the difference. It, but isn't the danger about romanticizing the Swiss cantons that in 1989, yeah. one of them uh, was forced by federal yeah. uh, law to allow women to vote because yeah. until 1989, one of the most conservative cantons in, in which only men voted. It was so, in a wooden appenzel as right. it happens. Yeah. So, so democracy, let's be clear about this, democracy is no guarantee of equality or indeed of human rights, even if the Athenians are responsible both for the origins. Well, there I make a distinction. The ancients didn't have much of a notion of individual rights, because why do we think they're important? Why do we historically have them? It's because we react against the state. So first of all, the absolutist monarchical state, then variously oligarchic republican states, but the notion that Big Brother is them, not us. Well, the ancients didn't, because they were small and relatively homogeneous and relatively fluid, they didn't have this the state and us distinction. And you speak in praise of uh, local democracy, and yet you lament uh, the leave vote from the EU. Now, surely <laughs> no other body represents the removal of democracy from the habitual, everyday, face-to-face, 
local Still engagement than the EU. So how do you not think there's a contradiction? There? there is no contradiction. What you say is entirely correct, and I am no admirer of the EU's constitution, the non-electability of the Commission, etc., etc. But I personally did not vote the way I did um, purely because the EU as a whole, which includes us, um, is a brilliantly democratic institution. I voted to remain in it with the hope that one day it might get more democratic, but because the negative consequences of not being in it are terrifying. Uh, and I don't mean just economic, I mean cultural, I mean uh, social. And you speak about institutions and the lottery now, Open Democracy's founder, Anthony Barnett, wrote a book called The Athenian Option, Indeed. in which he argued that we should reintroduce sortition to the House of Lords. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's a good idea, and how would it work? Well, you would have, I think, given the complexity of the modern world, um, to have constituencies in the way they do in Ireland, so that people would represent uh, their area of either their what their religion was or what their business was or what their expertise was. For example, there are senators in, in Ireland who are academics and so on. So within that system, then you would have, I think, two-stage process. Those people who put their names forward and you would, by the lottery, encourage people's peers who are not chosen from above but are chosen from below. Out of that, and this is an ancient Athenian system, there would then be some vetting because you clearly don't want certain types of criminal or, and so on, people holding certain, let's say, racist or other uh, extreme fundamentalist religious, you know what I mean, some sort of vetting. But how do you vet against that? How can you democratically vet someone's views out of, that's not democracy, is it? It is, because we're all, we must surely stand for, we must surely stand behind what we have said or what we have done. So, I mean, if you've actually committed a crime and been found out and convicted, then obviously you are a condemned criminal, you have a record. But suppose somebody, it's well known on Twitter or whatever, utters racist or sexist or anti-religious remarks, that's not a suitable person to be uh, a member of the House of Lords, I would have argued. That's interesting. So, so like a jury, there is... There's a certain minimal check. That's Absolutely. very interesting. But isn't the problem here that who's making the check. Now, we, we might be, you know, liberal on, on this matter, but we have to acknowledge that if someone has a conservative religious view and their attitude towards homosexuality is something that we would disagree with, we, we might say it's not egalitarian. You know, that might be a representative constituency in Britain. Are we seriously going to prohibit that from sitting? I think that's where I go for my Voltaire, that I'll defend to the death your right to say that. Try to persuade me by all means, but you know I'm not going to silence. But should those people be legislated? Well, that's probably um, for the people as a whole to decide. Um, I think it's a tough one. And it's that old Greek word krisis. Isn't ah, it? That, that good. Has a, a point of, of decision. Yeah. I mean, we decision. use it negatively to mean yeah. everything's going wrong, but krisis in Greek meant uh, a decision point, and we are at that especially with our parliamentary democracy in this country, which is currently uh, failing. Thank you.